So today I am going to discuss about uh, the topics reverse vaccinology and antibody genes. And these top two topics uh, uh, belongs to your module four of unit two zero one course. First, I will start with reverse vaccinology and. Before entering into the, the direct topic, uh, I must uh, mention here about what are the conventional approach of the production of vaccine. So vaccine can be produced uh, for the pathogens irrespective of uh, virus or bacteria. And to produce this vaccine against a virus or bacteria, pathogen virus or bacteria, Firstly, you have to grow the pathogenic organism in a laboratory or else in an industry. Then you have to isolate the protein which can function as an antigen and purify it. Then you have to check uh, its immunogenicity and if it is showing immunogenicity then you have to go for identification of the genes that is actually encoding the protein which shows this antigenicity and genes are most likely to correspond to conserved antigens uh, uh, picked uh, out uh, that could be used in, a, in, in Vaccine. So here the genes uh, that has been identified uh, that is actually encoding the antigenic protein uh, should be inserted into a viral vector or maybe a other kind of vector and then it will be trans, uh, transfected uh, into first growing microorganism preferably uh, we have uh, we have chosen bacteria or yeast cell because they multiply very rapidly, and then we have to check expression of, of, the, of, of the of the of the protein there, and if it's sufficiently producing the protein, then we can uh, proceed further. Means uh, to check it uh, in a, in the laboratory using laboratory animals. So up to that, the production of vaccine in a conventional approach is carried out in two different uh, pathways, two different ways. So first, uh, you have to identify the pathogen. The pathogen contains three different, different compartments or three different parts. One is the surface protein and the surface protein, they have two different types of protein. One is the receptor protein, another one is the antigenic protein, then there is a core protein and your nucleus or the core part. So coat part and the core part. Coat part is most of the cases the nuclear capsid, capsid and the core part is the nucleic acid. And it is the core part or the nucleic acid of the virus or the bacteria. It is actually encoding all the genes, all the proteins and it uh, resides in all the genes uh, resides at the genome. So here you can see this is this is the genome of the pathogen, like letter S, and three different colors: green, red, and yellow. So green part is encoding the receptor binding protein. The red part is the virulence factor, the virulence protein, and this yellow part is actually encoding the core. So, when we are preparing vaccines, so vaccines can be prepared in two ways, either in the live mode or in the kill form. So, in the kill form, you can use polysaccharide vaccine, you can use subunit vaccine, toxoid, like that. In the live form, you have to take the whole virus or the pathogen. Then you have to detoxify it, then you have to attenuate it or detoxify it, its virulence gene. A virulent property so that virulent property you can uh, go for 
uh, uh, for for uh, mutation, you can go for deletion of that that particular gene, a fragment of the gene, or the whole gene, or else. At first, you have to delete the virulence factor, and then you can integrate it into a vector and express it in the in, in the uh, in a host cell, bacterial cell, or yeast cell. So, in both the cases, you can prepare two different types of vaccines. One is your live uh, attenuated vaccine, or else killed vaccine. In the form of subunit vaccine, polysaccharide vaccines, or toxoid. So this is the conventional approach. But the question is, then why should we go for reverse vaccinology? What is the requirement of reverse vaccinology? So in conventional approach, vaccines are basically prepared. Two different types of vaccines are prepared, and to identify, we have to grow, cultivate. The microorganism or the pathogen, and then dissect into the microorganism into different components. And each and every component, and each and every fraction, should be tested for its immunological response. And the component that is showing the maximum immunological response can be considered as the antigenic protein. And it allows only those antigen which are abundant protein to quantify, show the less abundant protein cannot be targeted. And to screen this process, it takes decades to identify and to grow such target proteins, and still it can fail sometimes after so much of effort, so much of time, money, everything. If it is not able to induce best immune response, so to reduce the time frame, to reduce the cost, scientists have developed a different technique, a different technology, which is known as reverse vaccinology. Here, we are not using the microorganism. Instead, we are using the genome of the pathogen. And this novel approach is known as reverse vaccinology. So how we can do that? First, we have to sequence the genome. Then we have to check the genome using bioinformatic tools, using in silico approach or dry lab approach. Then we have to go for transcriptomic and proteomic studies. And then the three-dimensional uh, structure of the protein. There you have to, uh, you have to select the epitope B and, uh, and, and, and uh, the T-cell receptors, T-cell epitope, but they are not. After that, we will check its immunogenicity in laboratory animals, mice, and, uh, and, and rabbit. And if it works fine, sufficient amount of immunological response we are getting, the maximum response we are getting, then we can go for phase one, two, and three trial. Means in human trial. And if your phase three trial shows encouraging data, then you have to approach to FDA, Food and Drug Administration, for the approval to go for phase four trial. And after passing the phase four trial, you can implement it uh, in the form of a vaccine. So this particular technology was first uh, identified by Reno Raponi, and he was first to use against serotype B of meningococcus. So this is the flow of the production of reverse vaccinology genome analysis to clinical trial. And most of the cases we are, we are using the dry lab, not the wet lab. And here only for the high throughput cloning, expression, and purification, we are using the wet lab. Then immunogenicity checking in animal as well as in clinical trial. 
with cross-protective vaccine candidates. And that thing we have to go using wet lab. So this is all about uh, reverse vaccinology, how reverse vaccinology uh, is actually functioning. The flow chart is here. So genome sequencing analysis, then prediction of novel antigen from the sequence analysis data, and then recombinant protein expression using some artificial vector as well as in, in uh, high high yielding uh, microbes in the form of bacteria or yeast. Then we have to check immunogenicity uh, in laboratory animals, mice, or rabbit. And after that, if we can go for phase one, phase two, phase three human trial, and subsequently uh, phase four trial after FDA approval, and then you can market it even the form of vaccine. So this is uh, the developmental stages uh, of vaccine, like conventional reverse vaccinology technique. Now I am coming to the immunoglobulin gene. So the first uh, direct evidence that DNA is rearranged uh, during B cell development came in the year 1970s from the experiment in which molecular biologists compared DNA from early mouse embryo here, uh, which do not make antibodies with the DNA of a mouse. B cell tumor, which makes a single species of antibody molecule. The specific variable region and the constant region coding sequences that uh, the tumor cells used were present on the same DNA restriction fragment in the tumor cells, but on two different fragments, uh, restriction fragments in the embryos. So this rearranged uh, at, at some stage uh, in B cell development. So antibodies, we know that antibodies are proteins and proteins are evolved by genes. Antibody diversity therefore causes a spatial genetic problem. So how can an animal make uh, more antibodies than there are genes uh, in its uh, genome. This is a question. And this problem is, uh, is, is, is not quite as formidable as it might first appear. Recall that the variable regions uh, of, of, of both the light and heavy genes of immunoglobulin usually form the antigen binding site. Thus an animal with a thousand genes encoding light genes and thousand genes encoding heavy genes could in principle combine their products in 10 to the power uh, in, in different ways, means 10 to the power 6 different ways to make 10 to the power 6 different antigen binding sites. Nonetheless, the mammalian immune system has evolved unique genetic mechanisms uh, that enable it to uh, generate uh, an almost unlimited number of different uh, AL and uh, H chains, since light and heavy chains, in a, in a remarkably economical way by joining separate genes segments together before they are uh, transcribed. So uh, this discussion uh, of, of, the, of the mechanism of that B cells use to produce antibodies with an enormous diversity of uh, antigen binding sites. So we can consider how uh, how 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 a B cell uh, can alter the tail region of the uh, antibody next while uh, keeping the antigen binding sites unchanged. This ability allows the B cell to switch from making membrane uh, bound antibody to making secreted uh, antibodies, uh, or from, uh, from making uh, one class of antibody to making another, all without uh, changing the antigen specificity of the antibody. 
So we know that uh, in an uh, immunoglobulin, so each type of antibody chain, kappa uh, light chain, lambda light chain, and heavy chains, has a separate pool of gene segments and exons from which a single polypeptide chain is eventually synthesized. Each pool is on a different chromosome and contains a large number of gene segments encoding the G region of the antibody chain and smaller number of exons encoding the C region. Uh, during the development of the T cell, a complete coding sequence for each uh, of the two antibody chains to be synthesized is assembled by site-specific genetic recombination. And, uh, so in addition to bringing together uh, the separate gene uh, segments and the C region exons of the antibody gene, these rearrangements also activate transcription from the gene promoters through changes in the relative positions of the uh, enhancer and silencer acting uh, on the promoters. Thus a complete antibody chain can be synthesized only after the DNA has been rearranged. As well as uh, uh, we, shall, we shall see that uh, the process of joining gene segments here contribute to a diversity in uh, antigen uh, binding sites in, uh, in several ways. So here in, in, in immunoglobulin genes, you can see the immunoglobulin gene system is comprised of uh, three different, uh, three separate uh, gene uh, loci of, of the light, uh, light chains and the heavy chains. And each containing a variable region here, you can see the variable region V1 to V40, and a constant region here, C, and the LG, that is the number 157, so an H chain genes are located on mouse uh, chromosome 6, 16, and 12, respectively, uh, and uh, on human chromosome 2, 22, and 14, respectively. So, molecular cloning and structural characterization of the immunoglobulin gene have shown that DNA arrangement or DNA rearrangement, uh, rearrangement plays essential role uh, in the somatic application of the immunoglobulin diversity that manifests in two aspects. The ability to bind uh, an enormous number of uh, antigens and the ability to trigger a variety of immunologic reactions. Such studies made long uh, debating immunologists more or less uh, anonymous. anonymous uh, <clears throat> on how uh, the immunoglobulin uh, diversity is, is, is generated. And structural analysis of the immunoglobulin gene have also given uh, new insights. So here you can see transcription. This so is RNA transcript and then it can go for RNA splicing and we'll prepare the mature mRNA. And then this will go for translation and producing the life chain. This is a polypeptide chain. So, the genomic structure of immunoglobulin genes, if you focus on the human immunoglobulin genes, comprises three uh, linkage groups. The genes encoding the kappa and the lambda uh, L chains are located on chromosome 2 and 22, respectively, and the H chain genes are found in chromosome 14, although these gene families share general features. The respective organization is very much unique. So if you look into the kappa L chain genes, the genome organization uh, of the human kappa leukocytes is, uh, is, 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 is uh, uh, 
a single uh, constant region uh, is located towards the centromere. And a cluster of uh, five uh, joining regions, J regions, occur immediately if I prime to the to the C gene, C kappa gene. A large cluster of 76 uh, variable gene segments is located further upstream of the J region or the joining region. So they are organized into two groups. One group which is the most uh, proximal uh, to the J cluster contains 40 uh, variable uh, gene segments and another group which is uh, distal uh, to the J cluster contains 36 gene segments. The proximal and the distal groups appears appear to be uh, to be to be derived from one another as the sequences of many of the genes in in one cluster are closely related uh, to members uh, in the other cluster. And this organization indicates that uh, the cluster are likely to have uh, arisen from a common ancestral group of genes. Uh, that underwent a, a duplication event. So the majority of the of the of the V genes in the proximal group are are in the same transcriptional polarity as the J regions and the C uh, kappa region, whereas the V, v gene segments in the uh, distal segments are in the opposite transcriptional uh, polarity. Thus, the, prox, uh, the, the, the primordial duplication uh, event uh, probably occurred by inversion. So, if you look into uh, the uh, lambda L chain genes, uh, the lambda uh, lo locus resembles the kappa locus uh, in uh, that uh, V gene segments. The picture is not shown here. The J regions and the C regions exist as separate entities. However, in contrast to the kappa locus, the lambda locus contains seven C genes and each has its own J regions. So three of these uh, seven CJ clusters are considered uh, pseudogenes because they contain either in frame stop codons or frame shifting deletions. That prevent their, their expression. The V lambda gene segment cluster is located upstream of the C J lambda cluster and consists of approximately 70 members, of which 30 to 35 are classified as pseudogenes. And V lambda genes are classified into uh, 10 subgroups of, of, of related genes. So unlike V kappa genes, the V lambda genes are not uh, duplicated into proximal and distal clusters. A single V uh, lambda gene segment may be combined with uh, either of the four functional JC genes uh, to form a complete lambda uh, L chain gene. Now coming to the H chain genes, uh, here uh, you can see the H chain genes, AB chain genes. So the HN locus is more complex uh, than uh, either LGN locus. So there are nine functional CH regions, uh, uh, genes, that is mu, uh, C mu, lambda, and then uh, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, like that. And if so, so these encode the uh, different classes or isotypes of immunoglobulin polypeptide H chain. In case of IgM, IgT, the four subclasses of IgG, uh, the two subclasses of IgA and IgE, a non-functional uh, pseudogene uh, lies between uh, the gamma-1 and alpha-1 C genes. So the duplicated pattern suggests that the CH locus evolved by duplication of this group of genes. And uh, the, there are, here you can see that uh, there, is a, there is a region that is known as the D region, a D gene segment. So the VH uh, 
gene segment uh, located upstream from the CH gene. And uh, there are uh, approximately 130 VH gene segments, but only about 45 are functional. The VH gene segments have been assigned to seven subgroups based on their sequence relatedness. And individual members of a family are not uh, grouped together, but are, uh, but, but are interspersed uh, dispersed into, uh, throughout, interspersed throughout uh, the V gene cluster. So the H locus uh, contains six J, J region, J1 to J6. Uh, in contrast to either L chain locus, there is an additional cluster of element uh, that is uh, the, the D element, a D region. Uh, which is uh, known as the diversity segment or region segment uh, that are located between the V and the J clusters and approximately 25, uh, 25 uh, functional uh, functional D region genes have been uh, described here. So there are 51 V segments, 27 25 to 27 D segments here. Uh, here shown 27 D segments and six J segments, and an ordered cluster of C region exons each cluster, including different classes of the region. The D segment and the part of the J segment includes amino acids in the third hypervariable region, which uh, is uh, the most variable part of the D region. And this figure uh, is not uh, drawn to scale the total length of the heavy chain locus is over the basis. So moreover, many details are omitted. For instance, uh, each region is encoded by multiple exons. There are four clusters of uh, C, uh, C gamma exons, uh, C, uh, C gamma region exons. And then, uh, then the VH gene segments are clustered on the chromosome or in groups of homologous families. And the genetic mechanism involved in, in, in producing a heavy chain are the same as those shown in this figure. Uh, for uh, for light chain, except uh, the uh, that that the do DNA rearrangement uh, steps are required instead of one. So. Here, the, the first D segment joins to the to the G segment, and then the V segment joins to the, the D J segment, or rearranged to the to the to the rearranged uh, D J segment. So that's all about uh, today's lecture.